So hey, how's everybody doing? Well, I mean, never mind. You can't answer me. Uh, I hope everybody's staying safe and having a good time. Um, and yeah, we'll kind of jump right into it. So let me get these. Uh, let me start sharing here, and I will uh, get my slides up. All right. All right. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about building adaptive systems. Uh, this is something that we've been working on at uh, Bleacher Report where I work for a little bit now and kind of experimenting with. And uh, we're really excited to kind of help share some of this stuff with everybody else because I think it's really exciting. Um, uh, it's, none of this is necessarily super new. Uh, lots of companies have done these kinds of things. Lots of research has gone into this. There's lots of white papers about it. Uh, but it's fun to talk about it. Um, I'm really excited about the possibilities here uh, and, and kind of the future where we can go with this. So where I work at Bleacher Report, we have a lot of servers and we have a lot of services. And those services need to talk to each other. So they have requests that have to send back and forth. And under normal circumstances, this works very well. We just say, I have a request. It sends over the request. And the other service says, yeah, not a problem at all, fam, and sends it back. And this works out great, right up until something goes wrong. And something always goes wrong because we live in this like really dynamic universe. We have uh, you know, changing servers, we have deployments going off. Uh, someone might introduce some latency, someone might talk to a database that they don't even, they're not even supposed to own and has something got misconfigured and you know, all kinds of things can happen. And so what can happen is this server says, I have a request for you. I need you to satisfy it. And you send it over and the server says, actually, I'm a little bit busy right now. And of course, that's exactly when you're gonna have some crazy traffic spike. Some news is gonna break and everyone's gonna come to the site all at once. And so the upstream thing says, actually, I have even more requests I need you to do. I have a lot more requests you, I need you to do. And it's gonna send them all immediately to the downstream thing until eventually the downstream thing, our downstream service says, I can't handle this anymore and falls apart. And that's already bad. That's like not a good scenario already, but it's actually not even the full story because of course the upstream thing isn't alone out there in the world it's also getting requests and those requests are queuing up in front of it. And so when it's down, when the downstream service it's talking to goes away and it doesn't know what to do, it can't do anything but also kind of give up until it falls apart. And these sorts of overload scenarios are sort of just a, a fact of life. We see these in services that are talking to each other uh, that we control but we also see them in services that we don't control. So we might be utilizing some external thing, uh, some, some service that we pay for, or it might be a database. It might be you know, something that normally works great that's hosted by a reputable hosting provider and runs, runs very well. Um, and, but for whatever reason on that specific day, we see this massive increase in latency or we see some sort of performance degradation. And this can also happen inside of your system, right? Um, we have, might have two gen servers that are trying to talk to each other and one of them gets bogged down for whatever reason and you need to be able to adapt and mitigate that. It's also important to remember that all services have objectives, like they have goals they have to hit. And these are often things like, um, number of queries per second. It's the number of requests that you can manage uh, in a specific time frame, And it might be, you know, 10 requests a second. It might be a thousand or it might be more. But if you're being paid money <laughs> by someone to provide a service, you have these kinds of goals. And you have to be able to sort of achieve them. Like that's, you know, you might even have like real agreements. Some of these might be contractual agreements. You have to really be able to satisfy those things. I'm going to now make the claim that a resilient service, you should be able to withstand about a 10X traffic spike and continue to meet your goals. 
Now, I want to be really clear on this that I don't mean if your you know, target goal is 100 requests a second, that when you receive 1,000 requests, all of those extra 900 requests get satisfied to their fullest extent, right? You're, you're, you're completely 100% satisfied. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that if you receive 1,000 requests, 100 of them are still being met satisfactorily. Um, and you can throw the rest of them away or do something else with the rest of them, but a hundred of them still need to work. And those are the kinds of goals and objectives that we're going to talk about. Uh, and really the, the reaching those goals is what this whole talk is about. Um, it's not about higher performance, although this factors into that. It's about how you continue to reach those goals in sort of an ever changing and dynamic landscape. So in order to talk about that, we're gonna cover three things. Some of this is gonna seem a little obvious to people, but I hope that it's informative in the sort of the way that we think about these things. But we're gonna talk specifically about queues and queuing theory. We're gonna do just a tiny bit of math. Um, and that math is gonna give us an intuition about how to build these systems and how to think about these things. We're gonna talk a little bit about overload mitigation. And finally, we're gonna talk about adaptive concurrency. All right, so let's talk about queuing theory. So what causes overload, right? When systems get overloaded, what's really happening? Um, what's the intuition about it? It turns out it feels pretty obvious and the math is almost somewhat trivial, but most computer systems boil down to queues. Um, and you can think about this in sort of the large scale, like your application has queues inside of it. Uh, if you've used any sort of tool like Poolboy or, or um, Sbroker or uh, Nimblepool or any of these sorts of things, those are just mechanisms to manage queues. Uh, they manage you know, work that needs to be processed. Uh, and that works all the way down to the network layer. It works at your hardware layer. You, know, you can really model most computer problems as a queue. And the way you get overloaded is this very simple equation that if the arrival rate, which is to say the, how quickly things actually show up into the queue, if that's greater than it takes to process each item, then the line's gonna grow, then the queue's gonna grow. And we can think about that intuitively. We understand that, like if you've been to, you know, the line at the grocery store, um, if more people are showing up to the line than it takes to check people out of the line, the line gets bigger and bigger. We understand this. Um, the problem is, is that in computer systems, uh, this is what leads to overload. And overload leads to a bunch of knock-on effects like services going down. In order to figure out the actual amount of things that are in a queue at any given time, we can use the now uh, often talked about, uh, potentially tired, but always still very useful Little's Law. Uh, and if you've literally had been in any talk or read anything about queuing theory, this is the one that gets trotted out. And it gets trotted out because it's actually really important. The math behind it is uh, almost, um, it, it seems almost trivial. It's kind of got an M e equals MC squared thing going on, which is that the math itself isn't all that novel. It makes a lot of intuitive sense, but what it implies is really, really important. And that's why it's useful in a whole bunch of contexts. Um, but Little's Law states that the elements in the queue, the amount of things waiting to be worked on, is equal to the arrival rate multiplied by the average processing time. And it's important to note that those are averages. You can look at just average arrival rate, average processing time, and then you can work that out to be the number of elements in a queue. So let's see if we can build an intuitive understanding of how this works. So if we have a server and its uh, processing time is 100 milliseconds and we send 10 requests a second, well, that basically kind of works out to balance each other out. And so at any given time, we should have one request pending. So if we send a request, it'll be satisfied, and it's satisfied just in time for the next request to show up, and so on and so forth. We can do this over and over again, and we'll continue to process requests and send them out of the system before the next thing shows up, which is great. Uh, we don't have anything queuing up. There's no extra pressure in our system because of that, and uh, we're able to maintain a very healthy system at that point. But what happens if that average uh, processing time increases? Let's say it doubles, it goes to 200 milliseconds. Well now with some very simple math, we can, get, we can say that that's equals two things in the system at any time. 
And we can see that if we send a message in, and we send more messages in, because it's taking longer to process, things will start to build. We'll send it out, and by the time we start processing the next one, we've got more requests coming back in. And this happens over and over again. And at this point, the only way to get these things out of the queue is to decrease the processing time or just take some other mediation. Now, if you held steady at 200 milliseconds, then that might be fine. Maybe you can tolerate a certain amount of things in your queues and in your system just waiting to be worked on. But the problem is that these processes, these messages might be real things in your system. These might not be in, you know, outside of your beam. They might not be just on the network. They might be actual, you know, processes trying to be worked. And if they're actual beam processes, that increases your CPU pressure. You can start a lot of processes in the beam. It doesn't mean that you, can, you know, it doesn't mean there's not negative effects to that. And I promise you I've seen it. Uh, if you start running out of CPU, uh, you can't process things, you can't schedule things fast enough, uh, and stuff starts to get bogged down. And so because of this extra CPU pressure that starts to happen, our average latencies might increase and jump up to 300 milliseconds, at which point we have three things in the queue, and now stuff gets even worse. Until so eventually, you know, now it's taking you three whole seconds to process anything, and which when you have a lot more things in the queue. And if you just let this happen long enough, you know, then eventually you have infinity things. And it's been a while since I was in uh, college and did math like this, but I'm pretty sure that infinity times 10 is infinity. And this is really bad. This is what leads you to overload. And this is when systems start to fall apart. So we have to figure out how to mitigate this. It's also important to note that Little's Law applies in the small, but also applies in the aggregate. It applies across your whole system. So if you've got multiple services talking to each other, you can view that as a, sing as a single queue. And any pressure that you experience in the downstream thing leads to queuing in the upstream thing. You can use the same math to, to sort of work out what that's going to look like. So that's all the queuing thing theory we're going to talk about. That's, that's as much as it takes to understand the rest of this, which is really good. Uh, very, very simple math, at least that part of it. So obviously this is bad. We want to have a way to mitigate this. Um, and at the risk of sounding overly simplistic, if we know that, uh, that overload happens when the arrival rate is greater than the processing time, well then we have to get these two, th two variables under control. We have to somehow govern these two, these, these two things. And again, at the risk of sounding overly obvious, the only real way to do that is to start dropping stuff out of the queue. If you start to go above what your system's capacity is, you have to load shed. You have to take work off of the system in order to do that. And there's two really sort of big ways that we can do that, right? Uh, the upstream thing or, that, or the downstream service that you're calling can decide to drop requests. It can just say, I'm not going to satisfy this. I, I'm out of capacity. I'm not going to do this anymore and just start dropping stuff on the ground. Or it could queue it up and, uh, and, and have that queue be bounded and evict things based on smart, uh, you know, like buffer algorithms, stuff like that, queuing algorithms, um, and just drop stuff out of it. And there's a whole host of research that's gone into doing stuff like that. In the upstream service, we could also just stop sending requests. If we can tell, if we can detect somehow that the downstream service is having problems, well, we can just stop sending requests to it. Um, and that allows us to get requests out of the box faster. So our, our average processing time stays low and it allows us to take load off the downstream thing. And this is really it. This is your recourse. This is what you, this is what you can do. You have to drop load. This is really the only answer to it. There's a lot of other things that you can do to help this, um, but they're non solutions when it comes to, um, when, it, when it comes to a holistic way to talk about solving this. And I want to address some of those because there are things that get brought up a lot. So the first is auto-scaling. Auto-scaling is a non-solution to this problem. Um, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Kubernetes will not solve this for you. Uh, and, the, and the reason is because it's just not smart enough. Obviously, adding more capacity helps. And in most runtimes, if you've got a horizontally scalable application, adding more boxes and more nodes 
makes the system healthier. Like it's going to have more capacity to do more work. But that doesn't stop the fact that at some point you're going to reach the limits. And there's no auto scaler in the world that's fast, that's faster than your app shedding load. Um, and beyond that, if you're using some, you know, sort of like trivial signals to trigger your auto scaling, for instance, if you're looking at just CPU pressure or just memory pressure, you're most likely not scaling correctly. You're most likely triggering that scaling event at inopportune times. Um, so for instance, if you've got a server which talks to a server, which talks to a database, and the database has problems, that's gonna manifest as more things queuing up in the server. And that's gonna manifest as more CPU pressure. If you then use that signal to scale out, well now, guess what? You just made it worse because now the database is under even more load. Uh, and so you have to trigger auto scaling in response to load shedding, right? It, it, you, load shedding needs to be in that, uh, needs to be in that equation if you want to really get your auto scaling um, correct. I'm not saying auto scaling is bad, I'm just saying it doesn't help you, it doesn't get you out of the camp of having to shed load. The other only real partial solution to this is circuit breakers. Um, and again, I know this because we attempted to make circuit breakers sort of work for us for a lot of these cases for a long time. And I think incorrectly. Um, these do not help you, uh, what's the right way to say it? These are only a partial solution to this. And I'm not saying circuit breakers are bad. I love cir circuit breakers are good. Um, they're, they're really useful and you should use them in your system. The problem that this isn't a great solution, that circuit breakers aren't a holistic solution to this, uh, goes back to those goals and those objectives that your services need to meet. So again, if you have some, you know, some two servers talking and one of them experiences some sort of failure, what the circuit breaker is going to do is shut off all the traffic. And at that point, you're just not sending traffic to them anymore. But what if that downstream thing still had some amount of capacity? What if you could have still, um, in like gotten closer to hitting your objectives. The problem is if you shut off all the traffic and your goal is 100 requests per second, well, zero requests sent to it, you know, so it's impossible to hit that goal. So uh, you can't, you know, it doesn't really get you closer to that. Uh, and there's sort of a sledgehammer when it comes to solving these cascading failures. They're really good at that and you should use them. Um, but I would say that circuit breakers are really your last line of defense. Um, because you, you want to be able to adapt to the landscape a little faster. The other kind of major problem with this, with circuit breakers as a solution to this, is that for the most part, um, they're statically configured. And that means, you know, you're saying, if I see n number of errors in x number of time, then shut off for y duration, and then start trying to turn back on. Um, most systems aren't static. Most systems are highly dynamic and capacity is kind of always in flux like that. Uh, if you really understood your problem, you have a small set of boxes, you understand your traffic patterns really well, then maybe you can get away with this. Um, for the work that I do, we can't just get away with this anymore. Um, it's, the system's just too dynamic and it's, too, it's changing too quickly. So those are some ways to mitigate overload. At the end of the day, the only real way to do it is to shed load out of the system. And so we really need to focus on a way to do that smartly. And that leads us to adaptive concurrency. So at the risk of, uh, again, sounding obvious, we want the goal is to allow as many requests as we can handle, right? Uh, and actually satisfy them without overloading the system. And we need to do this in a way that adjusts to the changes as we go. Luckily, there's a white paper for actually everything. And in this case, it comes out of sort of network uh, theory um, and you know, sort of the underlying uh, algorithms that help the internet. <clears throat> and so the kind of words you wanna search for if you're gonna go Google this stuff afterwards and find papers on this, our uh, congestion control. Um, and there's a whole suite of algorithms that, that started back in 1988 um, and has you know, been improved upon over time, but this is sort of, sort of the original uh, research into this. And it's what people are trying to do is figure out ways to make the internet self-heal. Um, trying to figure out ways that 
It could adapt to new boxes coming and going in an ever-growing series of networks and be resilient to failures. So in a big picture, the way it works is that every system that you have, every box that you have, uh, has some sort of actual concurrency limit, some sort of actual capacity limit. I say concurrency limit, and what I really mean is like the amount of requests a second it can handle, or you know the uh, the amount of the, the sort of average latency, or these these sorts of signals. But it has some sort of limit, it has some sort of actual limit. And what the system is going to do, what these algorithms do is they dynamically discover what that limit is. And they do that by probing around the system by allowing more requests to go through or, or fewer. And using signals coming back from, the, from those requests to determine if it can allow more or less, if it needs to back off. And it will just essentially probe into the system and figure out how everything is functioning, how the system is working. Do we need to back off or not? And so what we can do is if we're gonna make a request, we can keep track of the number of in-flight requests that we have. We can know what our limit's supposed to be that we've dynamically discovered. And so for every request, we can start to ask, hey, are we at this limit? And if we are, we'll drop it. And if we're not, if we're still under it, then we can send that request on. Likewise, the downstream service can say, hey, am I at my limit? I know I have in number of requests already pending. I've got this much in the queue. Uh, am I still healthy? Can I still, uh, can I still satisfy this? Or do I need to drop this request or queue it up or delay it? If it's still healthy, it'll send it on. Otherwise, it'll drop it. And then based on measurements that happen at that point, things like latency, did we drop it? Did we time out? Like what's going on in the system at that point? We can update both of these limits. And these can happen independently without coordination. Uh, and the without coordination is really, really important. So what happens is we've got the system, it's running normally, we've probed around the system, we've figured out what our limits are, and then all of a sudden some new latency comes in and it decreases our amount of capacity. Maybe we like made a deployment and the deployment uh, took a whole bunch of nodes out of the system or a bunch of nodes failed and the, something went wrong, you know, all, you know, all sorts of reasons that we could drive uh, capacity down and the system can adapt to that. It can back off really rapidly and then come back up again and try to, again, find out what our actual values are. In order to achieve this, we use a couple different signals. One of them is latency, as I've said. The others could be like successful versus failed requests. And there's a whole bunch of different algorithms we can use to discover what that uh, limit actually is. Um, the most sort of famous of these, the one that lots of people are aware of, and sort of one of the original uh, algorithms was, or is, additive increase and multiplicative decrease. And the, the idea being that uh, successful requests increment the number the limit that you're the capacity limit and uh if for whatever reason you see failures and you start backing off you do that by uh, multiplying the values out and so you back off much faster than you grow uh, and you kind of and that manifests as this sort of sawtooth graph that you'll see a lot uh, when looking at these kinds of systems so if you want to do this in your application and your services that you're building today there's a bunch of options um, uh, there's uh, PO Box, S Broker, Safety Valve, Fuse. These are all things that we've used um, and have, have played around with uh, for a bunch of different reasons. And each of these are really useful depending on the kind of problem that you want to solve, depending on how you want to manage uh, the queues in your system. For us, uh, none of these quite did exactly what we wanted to do. And so we've started working on a new library, uh, which has been very recently published. Uh, called Regulator. Uh, total caveat here, I would not recommend people to use this yet, um, but if you're interested in this stuff, I would definitely recommend checking it out because um, I think it could be useful and we're certainly starting to experiment a lot with this uh, in our work that we're doing right now. Um, the way you use it's really simple. I almost made it through this entire talk without showing any code. Uh, this is all you get. Uh, that's, my, that's, a, that's a 2020 uh, resolution for myself. But you install a regulator, you can choose the type of limit that you want to use. So AIMD would be additive increase, multiplicative decrease. Um, and then when you want to see if you have available capacity, you can just ask it. And if uh, we have capacity, then we'll um, call the callback and you can do whatever you want in there. 
and otherwise you get a drop to add them back out and we'll just drop the request immediately. Um, there are other options you could delay, uh, at which point you, you now have to have sort of queuing algorithms to know how to drop things out of the queues and have bounded queues and that kind of stuff, which is uh, future work that we're gonna be adding. There are other algorithms in there as well. So there's a gradient algorithm that's actually based on some work that Netflix did, um, based on talking to them and some of the people who worked on that uh, is how, how we derived a similar algorithm. And that has different characteristics. It allows us to, it, it, has it just allows for different operations. It's, it handles bursty traffic a little bit better and that sort of stuff. And there's, there's also static limits. There's a whole kind of host of things in there um, that you can play around with. So that's how, we, that's how we're starting to talk about adaptive concurrency and we're starting to roll this out into our services. Um, and so uh, in order to kind of wrap up here, um, I just wanted to review kind of what we've covered. So the first is that queues are sort of everywhere. Queues are all over your system. Um, they're definitely beneath your system. You know, the beam has multiple queues that it's, that it's using to schedule work uh, and, and get all those processes that you're spawning uh, doing work for you. But there's also queues in your application. And most of those queues, the queues that are in your application code, those are not bounded queues. And if you want to avoid overload, you have to bound those queues in some way. Um, you have to sort of seek to control that stuff. And uh, this is the way that we're trying to do that for a certain subset of problems. Um, this may not be exactly the way you need to do that for your system, but you do have to solve this problem at some level. Uh, and if your system is dynamic, your solution to that problem is also gonna have to be dynamic. It's going to have to adjust to the landscape. Uh, it's going to have to adjust to how things are working and, and adjust to, uh, to, to your system. And finally, uh, I just want to leave you uh, with this, which is that I think you should go out and build awesome stuff. I think uh, people ask me a lot how we grow the community, and I think this is it. I think going out and building cool things and telling people about it and sharing your successes uh, and your failures is the way that we grow this community. And uh, and if we do that, um, we'll continue to have this, this really awesome, vibrant place that we can all hang out and continue to build cool stuff. So thanks. Thank you, Chris. This was great. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two questions, uh, which we're asking Huva. Also, please, uh, Chris, try to visit uh, the question tab later after the talk to address all the other questions. But I will read this one out loud. Mm, how much does back pressure help here? Yeah, so back pressure does actually help a lot. Um, and I think, generally speaking, you, uh, for service to service communication, um, you can kind of achieve that back pressure, right? Um, it still forces the queue to happen. And the problem is, is that there's no real good way to apply back pressure to a bunch of clients that you don't actually control, right? If a thousand people just show up to your website, that's like an unbounded queue problem. Uh, and so at that point, now you have to get into the, to, the, to the place where you have to just shed that load. Thank you. We are now running out of time. So thank you very much again for a great talk. And uh, I will see you around.